uh, it's, it's a great opportunity to um, come together, into, isn't it, internationally, but at the same time, uh, we've got to thank the people who make it possible, and there they are. The question we're always asked is, will the slides and the presentation and the chat be available afterwards? And the answer is yes. The recording, the slides, the web chat will be available. I say shortly there. It's likely to be the early part of next week at learningandskillsgroup.com. If you are a member, great. If you're not a member, it's free. It requires no work to sign up other than just going to that site, learningandskillsgroup.com, and registering yourself. The sound will come through a headset or your computer speakers. And if you can't do that, or if you're having trouble with the sound quality, then please go ahead and dial in. There are the numbers on the screen, and I'm just going to drop them into the text chat area, and I will do that at various points during the presentation. Um, sorry about that rather shouty DOM I've got there in caps. Obviously, the reboot has uh, stiffened my ego in some form, and I feel I now need to have my name in capital letters. We do use chat a lot in these sessions, so please do contribute. I, I can see everyone's doing that already. Uh, if you're not sure what to do, then it's pretty straightforward. There's a box at the bottom of the screen, bottom right-hand corner. Just type in there and hit return, and your comments will appear. Very important that we, we chat because we share with everybody our thoughts. One of the great advantages of online sessions is that everyone can contribute simultaneously. And <laughs> not only that, <laughs> when they contribute simultaneously, usually people say stuff that's worthwhile. If you're enjoying the session, LSG, hash LSG webinar is our hashtag. Please let people know um, because uh, we do like to, to share the good news about how great it is to have LSG webinars and to have uh, webinars in general. Okay, that's probably enough from me. It's a late start and uh, you're not here to listen to Don talking about the, the beauty of the webinar, but rather to listen to Armit Garg talking about reasons for considering mobile learning. And there we are, Amit. I'm going to hand it straight over to you. Amit, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, John. Can everybody hear me all right? We can hear you. You're slightly faint, Amit. You might want to speak as, as uh, loudly and clearly as you can. All right. Is this better? A little bit louder. Let me try that. Is this that's better? Good. That's, that's good. Thank you very much. That's great. Go ahead. Brilliant. All right. Thanks, John. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction and welcome everyone to this webinar on uh, reasons for considering mobile learning. I just hope I can continue with this volume of audio. All right. So we'll uh, get straight into this. So the topic for today, reasons for considering mobile learning largely has been chosen because we find that a lot of organizations are getting into mobile learning for not the right reasons. And a lot of them are actually staying away because they're not yet realized that there is a great potential in moving on to mobile learning. OK, so before we begin, if I can quickly understand, uh, you know, and for everyone else to understand how many of us are really doing any mobile learning. Uh, I've just given some options, uh, quite a bit, a little uh, thinking to start soon, or no plans at, at all. But of course, as, as people are answering the chat area, they, they, you can put in any sort of um, variation on that you want. Plenty of people thinking about it by the looks of it, Ahmed, thinking about starting soon. A little. Yes, I am starting soon. No plans at all, but want to. And that's an interesting variation. What do you think, Armit? Is this really the sort of thing you were expecting? Pretty much. Actually, Don, it's very interesting that some of the recent research that has come out is actually trying to tell us that mobile learning is uh, off to a slow start. So I'll, I'll just uh, look into some of these recent research that have come about uh, from ASTD, the first one that I have here is they have, uh, in, in May 2012, they released this report on mobile learning where uh, they simply said that in spite of having a, a good correlation between learning effectiveness and market performance, over two-thirds of respondents actually don't have uh, any mobile learning uh, being happening right now, which is quite surprising, but that's, that's the state of the industry as of now. Closer home, 
we had similar numbers coming out from towards maturity in the last benchmark study where about 39% of organizations were really delivering something on mobile learning uh, to their staff members. Slightly more than what you saw in US uh, uh, from ESTD. Is towards maturity also had listed uh, mobile learning as uh, the second most uh, anticipated fastest growing technology in 2013. So yes, it's there on the mind. So pretty much uh, what what our audience is saying, uh, thinking about it, doing a little bit. Uh, some of them actually don't have any plans. There's another interesting. Uh, trend from uh, towards maturity report, which is about uh, the anticipated versus the actual numbers that you see typically. The anticipated numbers have been quite high, uh, but the actual implementations have been comparatively low. So maybe in the next report that comes out, uh, I think it's out in next month, we should see about 50% uh, adoption, maybe more than that, hopefully. This is uh, kind of a you know, comment that summarizes the state of the industry, which might not uh, sound very good, but would be very comforting to a lot of uh, the audience members here, where the vice president of the global talent management at Hertz Corporation says, I do think we need to provide access of material when and where it is imperative to have a mobile learning strategy, but I don't find many organizations actually doing it. And he's talking about large global organizations. So that's actually uh, you know, kind of comforting, because you know that the train has not really left the station as yet. Uh, not many organizations are really doing it. Maybe one third if you were to take an average around the world and that to in the Western world. Uh, but yes, it is getting to that stage where uh, more and more people are adopting it, and probably the train will leave soon. Another question for you, people who have not been uh, implementing anything or thinking about it, if you could share, what has been your reason for really not adopting mobile learning so far? Is it very confusing with too many platforms, technology, devices to really think about? Uh, too costly to implement, you believe? There's an issue with integration with legacy systems, or security issues is the biggest issue. Or measurement would be an issue. How would you really measure? Was it effective or not? Or any other? Um, while, we're, while we're just getting those answers, and I do look very interesting, uh, Ahmed, can I just ask a quick question? Well, oh, there's a good point here about the debate out about uh, bring your own device and cost. Um, can I just ask a question? Um, are you on a mobile phone or a cordless phone at the moment, Armit? I'm actually on a cordless phone. Is it, is it possible to get a, a landline phone or a copper wire phone? That would be really helpful because it's, a, it's still a bit um, crackly. Okay. Uh, let, let me try that. Okay. So while, while I'm it's, um, looking at that, I'll just quickly reflect on this. And also, I, I will raise the point that was, a, that was asked earlier about, um, when Armit gets back, about the business of how do we define mobile learning. It's interesting that many of the questions that are coming in, or the issues which is, have caused a slow adoption of mobile learning, have been around uh, cost, um, although uh, Jessica's adding, other priorities until now. Um, and it's... There's a, there's a wide range of potential problems. Connectivity is another of potential issues. And John Carrington says it's just too confusing. Measurement and confusing platforms plus infrastructure, uh, plus, sorry, plus the sector with little infrastructure. Um, I think we'll, we'll definitely come back to the infrastructure question uh, later on because it's not perhaps as straightforward as it might seem just to ask people to uh, go ahead and pick up their phones and get mobile learning. And some of the business of bring your own device, as uh, Sarah Dunn says, is not easy. And Martin Ducker says, it's considering whether M-learning is appropriate for the retail industry. Does it actually work? Proof of ROI, says Stephen James. Um, it is ROI that needs proof. Okay, we'll come back to the ROI question later on. Um, and 
um, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that because I think that is an important issue. Uh, Amit, are you back with us on the call? I'm still on this. I'm just trying uh, from a different line. Okay. Well, we've got a slight echo, but I'll tell you what, you, ca you carry on because um, obviously we don't want to hold up the momentum, especially with the late start. So carry on, carry on with this. A, a number of interesting questions there, and I will just drop the question in Amit about um, the definition of mobile learning, which we, sh we should probably get to at some point, but uh, I'll, right now I'll hand the presentation back to you. Amit. All right. I I'll just try to be a little louder so that everybody is able to hear that clearly. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so when we talk to a lot of clients, you know, I have been suddenly speaking to a lot of uh, uh, prospects and clients who have been interested in uh, delivering mobile learning to their uh, posts. But yes, uh, like them, uh, as the audience here was mentioning, you know, too many devices, sometimes costly, uh, not sure of how to measure, etc. But there are two key principles that uh, I try and uh, emphasize on to be understood and taken into account when you are thinking of mobile learning implementation. The first one really comes from this wordle that's been created by Judy Brown. It's available on Mlearnopedia. Uh, if you look at this, you know, here she's essentially tried to put in various things that you can do with mobile learning. So there are certain things that you would probably never uh, think of doing to mobile learning, or it would not fit into your definition of mobile learning by default, like note taking. Uh, sensors, etc. So this so one of the things that uh, we need to uh, really think about in mobile learning is that it is much more than what you would traditionally put into the definition of mobile learning. And I would typically refer to this as uh, mobile everything. The second key principle comes from Clark Quinn from his book on designing M-learning, where he says M-learning is about augmenting our learning and our performance. And I quite like the focus on uh, augmentation here and, and also the fact that he's trying to cover both learning as well as performance. And which is where I think uh, the crux of really evaluating whether M learning will work for you and implementing it properly so that it is a success lies. It is about augmentation, whether you are augmenting learning or performance. So it cannot be, you know, a, a direct derivative of this would be it cannot be a full course. You can't really think about delivering a 30-minute course on mobile. Uh, most mobile devices, uh, and of course, performance support is one of the core areas where mobile learning would be very effective. Let's call this mobile augmentation. So there are these two key principles which would typically form your mobile learning thinking hat, if, if you were to call that. Uh, and that should give a lot of uh, a benefit and kind of a head start in, in creating a good solution for mobile learning. So with this thinking hat on, what would you think we would be doing for this person if we at all have to do any mobile learning for him? So just to repeat the question, how are you going to make this person who's uh, obviously working as a lineman or something, uh, perhaps as an arborist, how are we going to make uh, e-learning, sorry, mobile learning useful for this? Whatever it is, presumably it has to be hands-free. Um, can you help us out, Armit? How is mobile going to help this person? Well, absolutely. Uh, I, I don't think definitely anyone is thinking about a 30-minute e-learning course on electrical concepts delivered on a mobile device. Uh, it could be some sort of a support program. It could be, uh, since his hands are kind of uh, occupied, it could be a voice-driven program. Uh, it could simply be just videos about how to do a certain task. 
which maybe he can activate uh, through voice, but watch once a video has started. But essentially, the, the crux of, of mobile learning uh, solutions is get into the learner's situations and context and see where they would really be able to utilize it most. And that, that probably is the most important uh, thing that we need to keep in mind when implementing mobile learning. So with those two principles, let's move on to uh, the reasons or why we would think that one should be considering mobile learning uh, in, in their organization. I've divided this into three parts. Uh, there is a mobile world that's really evolving around us. Uh, and we are all aware of that. We'll just touch on a few uh, data points of that and a key a set of key trends that are coming from there. Uh, those are, of course, in, in, uh, in impacting the workplace that we are currently in. And of course, the workplace is also being impacted by other factors. So there's a dotted line between uh, what impact the mobile world is having on the workplace. And both of these, the changing workplace, and the mobile world as, as it is evolving around us is presenting a great opportunity for all of, all of us in the L&D. Let's look at the mobile world. Of course, uh, everybody is aware of the invasion of mobile devices of all sizes and shapes, right from smallest smartphones to the largest tablets. And then you have something in between called tablets uh, specifically for uh, Samsung's uh, range of devices called Note. Uh, the critical point that I just wanted to make on this one is uh, the differentiation between the typical smartphones and typical tablets might just start vanishing now, given that tablets are there in between. Uh, tablets are becoming smaller and smaller. Uh, we're already hearing about an iPad mini that's going to come out. Uh, iPhone has increased in size. So we're kind of getting to a size uh, or maybe a couple of size options which would be most suitable for everyone. Looks like, but you never know. But yes, there is going to be a gradient of sizes that will be available from small to big. There's a definite shift that's happening on the computing front. We are moving from uh, mobile devices uh, or from uh, PCs to mobile devices. Now this is a slide which uh, uh, Don was referring to earlier, which actually uh, there's a little bit of a wrong representation here. I'll quickly uh, let you know what's that. Uh, the numbers for 2016 are the total of everything as they move vertically upwards. There's 500 million of uh, PC sales that you can expect in 2016, where a total of PC and smartphones will be 2 billion, and a total of all three will be 2.5 billion. It's not just the tablets, which is 2.5 million. Sorry about that. We were just trying to replace that slide in the last moment where there was wrong representation of data. But nevertheless, what this really is telling us is that Donnie was saying something? All right, so the, the critical part in this is simply about uh, that the smartphones and tablets are going to dwarf the, the PC market in a few years' time. There is an imminent death of feature phones, or sometimes what is called a, a dumb phone, that's uh, coming up. Uh, you have, that's the proportion of uh, smartphone sales that expected uh, in a particular year. So shipments of smartphones would increase to about 70%, 67% in 2016. And you have uh, you know, corporations like Sony, which have already announced that they are not going to make any more feature phones. Uh, Google had announced that smartphones are going to become cheaper, probably reaching a range of $70 uh, in next year. You are seeing that the surge of uh, smartphone sales is going to continue, and probably the feature phones will not uh, be prevalent so much. Uh, and of course, this is global figures, 
So you would probably see a higher proportion in the Western world. Of, uh, and also, uh, we'll see a higher proportion of smartphones being used uh, in workplace. So even today, there are reports which suggest that you have about 69% people were using smartphones, according to one research. And then there is uh, improving bandwidth and also instances of some free Wi-Fi. This is something that's been offered by O2 in London, uh, where anybody can simply get onto a free Wi-Fi and uh, uh, utilize it. So, and there are uh, plans like this happening in Chicago, in US, in various other places. Governments are funding such projects. Uh, telecom operators are looking at uh, seamless handshakes between one provider to another when you move from one zone to another. Uh, so probably in a few years' time, we would come to expect some sort of a completely free Wi-Fi or completely free transfer from one uh, provider to another in your one single package that you are using, which is obviously a big thing for uh, the kind of uh, mobile world that we are going to live in. Also, the BYOD movement has actually started, which indicates that a lot of organizations are already supporting uh, personal devices in the workplace to the tune of 72%. There's a report that was published earlier this year for data is of 2011. And uh, a very strong indicator of how people are accessing uh, internet on mobile, uh, the mobile internet usage is doubling every year. So we just extrapolated that data, and it may not really go like this uh, straight to the top, but it would obviously taper off somewhere. But you would still see uh, we touching about 50%, 60% very soon. A BYOD is uh, bring your own device. So organizations are actually uh, allowing people to bring their own device to the workplace and uh, in some cases, uh, allowing them to use uh, company applications and data on it. And another indicator of the mobile internet, how it is growing, is that some of the social applications have started getting close to 50 or more than 50% access to mobile devices, things like Twitter, and that's 2011 data. From the mobile world that we are living in, we'll probably move into something which is also being called as mobile only. Uh, this slide shows that uh, this is the percentage of people who access the internet only on their mobile devices or primarily on their mobile devices. You would expect you know, Asia and Africa to probably be uh, in those high ranges. But surprisingly, even US and UK have a large, fairly substantial large proportion of population which is accessing internet through their mobile devices. And it is predicted, say for US, in 2015, they would probably have more than 50% of people who are going to use the internet through their mobile phones much more than they would use it through the PCs. So that's actually leading us to a world where Mobile will become your primary device through which you will be accessing the internet. Let's get into the second aspect. So that's everything that we discussed about mobile world. Here is the second aspect of changing workplace, where the work itself is changing. We've known that through our own experience. But from this research by Dr. Kelly uh, from Carnegie Mellon University, uh, he says that uh, the percentage of knowledge that you need to memorize to do your tasks was about 75% in 1986. And it has dramatically come down to about 9, 8 to 10% in 2006. So that's the amount of information that uh, your staff needs to remember. The rest they are going to search, they're going to find, they're going to talk to someone, or maybe there are help systems, something is available. So the, the, the requirement then is really to equip them in the right skills to make sure that they're able to find the information when they need it. Another aspect of the changing workplace is the growing mobile workforce. Uh, IDC predicts that you'll have about 37% of the global workforce uh, as mobile workforce. So these 
will be uh, with people who are working from homes, from uh, cafes, from parks, from wherever. So, uh, the challenge for LMB and HR is really to uh, communicate with them properly, to be able to motivate them regularly, and of course to help them equip with uh, performance support tools and uh, material. It has often been cited that uh, the older generation or the baby boomers have really not been the ones who have been uh, comfortable with the mobile technology or in, you know, most of the new technology in general. So, but you know, recent research really suggests that a lot of them are getting on to the internet and that to mobile internet. Uh, about 25% of them actually accessed mobile internet in, in 2011 and it's predicted that that would go up to about 40%. So that's essentially about you know, even the, the the older sections of your staff are actually using mobile phones now uh, for accessing internet. Maps is just an just one of those examples which tells us that we are becoming dependent on mobile phones, and these personal behavior patterns would obviously translate to some expectations from the workplace and the kind of information uh, availability and access uh, mechanisms we create in, in the workplace. There's a term called nomophobia, which describes our situation when we uh, have our mobile phone lost, or battery runs down, or the network goes out. Uh, we, we obviously start feeling sad, and probably there's a feeling of anxiety as well. Uh, and a lot of people have that. Uh, uh, there are <laughs> numerous surveys which have pointed out uh, what would you like to give up instead of uh, uh, giving up your mobile phone for a week or so. And very interesting comments over there, including food, chocolates, and other things. And then there is the new workforce that's entering uh, the, the workplace now, which is the Gen Y or the millennials. And they bring in a completely new set of expectations to the workplace and how they would want uh, information to be created, shared, and accessed. Uh, I'll just list a few key characteristics, characteristics quickly of these uh, new set of uh, you know, expectations that are coming in. Uh, they need immediate attention. They have uh, kind of uh, grown up getting feedback on a regular basis. They have chatted with friends. They have used social media. They know that they put out anything on, onto the web, and somebody will respond. So when they say help, somebody responds. So they expect something similar happening in the workplace where they say, I don't know how to do this. So maybe they're expecting a network of people, experts, mentors, somebody available who can help them. There is a little bit of a mix between personal and uh, professional uh, uh, domains. Uh, both are getting mixed up, and these guys would expect a Friday dressing almost every day. They, Favor fast-paced environments. Quick promotions is one of the things that they would expect as being predicted. Uh, in a survey by Cisco, it was uh, found out that they would really value creativity. That is, the uh, acceptance of creativity in the workplace to be more than uh, more than even the salary component of of, of their package. They obviously want to work when they want to work. Nine to five is not cut out for them. Uh, as I said, that uh, professional and personal domains are getting mixed, so they would essentially focus on getting work done. But of course, they want more transparency. That's that's what the changing workplace is uh, throwing at us. Uh, and these two uh, changes, the mobile world and the any workplace, are really resulting in uh, presenting us a great opportunity, which is what we're getting now. Uh, I'm sure you have heard of Rod Fetson's five moments of learning need. That is, uh, the two of them are really focusing on knowledge acquisition, which is essentially talks about how do we really learn, uh, or when do we really learn. Uh, uh, he talks about when learning is done for the first time, or we are wanting to learn more, and trying to remember when things change and when something goes wrong. Uh, the first two are typically knowledge acquisition. Uh, the next three can be considered to be knowledge application when you are trying to do something. And this is where 
uh, mobile learning fits in the best, which is the next three. And they also are essentially situations where uh, they're doing something. They are performing. It becomes sort of performance support where we can help individuals learn and perform better in organizations. This is a, a graph taken from research by uh, Professor Will Thalmer. Uh, he's uh, talked about spacing learning events. Of course, we know that uh, after any formal training event, there are chances of losing what you have learned in that event within a few days if you're not applying it. So by spacing learning events, by giving shorter bursts of uh, maybe same information in different ways, summaries, quizzes, uh, uh, opportunity to describe it or discuss with others, etc applied in a fictitious situation. Uh, so all of those which are marked in the red are essentially based learning events that can be added on, and which is where, again, mobile would be very suitable. It's also a great opportunity to really address the 70, 20, 10 uh, ratio that uh, I'm sure you have been hearing about uh, formal, informal uh, components of uh, your training learning mix. Uh, we now have an opportunity with mobile to make informal uh, available to our learners. Uh, it has always been argued that uh, there's lots of budgets that are going into formal training. But how does uh, mobile really help with informal? Uh, here's a chart from uh, Gerson Associates, which essentially talks of uh, how continuous learning model can be applied and where mobile learning really fits in. So this also obviously picks up on the same concept of uh, attention being lost after a training event. But then you can actually deliver some sort of continuous learning uh, using uh, elements like social and mobile learning. And in a more elaborate manner, person goes on to explain uh, how mobile can be used in stages. The first one is, of course, just making mobile as an enabler, which is the first uh, column, uh, where you are presenting things on demand. You can have short courses. You can have uh, maybe books, articles, anything that is available for searching and reading when you want it, videos, etc. The second stage is make it an accelerator, where you are implementing some of the things that are listed here on the social side, which is social networks, communities of practice, et cetera. And then when you really uh, have experienced these, you can possibly look at embedding. Now, this is where a uh, you know, person is really suggesting that we could possibly use mobile as, as a great transformational opportunity which is where uh, we are very hopeful of uh, mobile learning really getting implemented in places. All right, so that's uh, essentially uh, the three main uh, areas that we have been thinking about on uh, why one should be considering mobile learning. And we do believe there's a great opportunity. Also, uh, we'll quickly look at uh, how to get started quickly and then take up some questions. Uh, I'll just uh, quickly move through this. So the first thing that we typically have been starting to say to our clients is just do it. You know, just do some of it. Just do a very small project. Begin with it. And why we are saying that is because, and essentially with that what we mean is strategy can come later. Why we have started saying that is we've seen get clients getting lost in a comprehensive strategy formulation process. It is complicated. There's no denying the fact that there are too many things to be considered. But at the same time, there is also a problem that the strategy should be seen as a moving target. So you will not be able to create a strategy uh, at any given point of time which will help you uh, to you know, for, for the next five years, let's say. So let's say if you were thinking iPhone 4, suddenly there is iPhone 5. Then you were thinking something else, then you think the iPad mini is better. And those things will continue to happen. So I think what would really help organizations is to start doing something. Even if it's a smaller project, uh, something which can be 
uh, done within uh, you know your control at a smaller scale which gives you important exposure and experience that can help create a more defined strategy later so this definitely applies more to the organizations which have never tried mobile learning or were just thinking of doing it they have done maybe one project but they have stopped after that for wanting to create a full strategy but yeah i think uh, if you can look at certain uh, low hanging fruits and if you can ensure that you have a clear business need identified for those projects uh, uh, you have a receptive audience and enabling technology and i think uh, one of the easiest low hanging fruits in most organizations is something related with the sales uh, teams they are typically mobile they are usually receptive if you go to really uh, give them something which is uh, you know budging on their own times and they can think of uh, doing it when they want it on devices that they carry with them and of course i think most organizations have this challenge of uh, delivering quality training to uh, the sales executives so which is which could be one of the areas that you can look at uh, there could be uh, uh, support guys people who go out in the field for troubleshooting etc they could be another uh, you know big area where you can possibly look at implementing something in mobile learning we have a few uh, quick examples that i just want to take you through uh, just to give you an example of uh, what what could be a quick uh, quick win or a low hanging fruit this is a ipad app that was created for uh, a communications event for the launch of a vehicle so it's a glamorized interactive brochure of a, of a product and you could possibly use that it could be your sales force to have something available from which they can learn and they can also educate their customers when they are meeting with them this is a second one where uh, on the on the bottles uh, that you see in the center which are essentially cleaning agents uh, we get it, the client is getting a qr code printed which could be scanned through a mobile device and that launches a how to video essentially uh, a just in time support to get things done how to use a product this is a a, a quick app which helps uh, uh, electricians to calculate the length of the cable that is required uh, when they are doing their jobs uh, this is a lengthy process and a complicated one involving uh, them to go through a lot of manuals checking charts and tables and feeding values into the calculator uh, and which could also we really go wrong sometimes if they choose wrong values just you know reading a wrong value from the table so this ensures uh, uh, apart from being easy and has other capabilities like storing data or getting feedback from supervisor etc this ensures compliance with the with the laws uh, or the standards and also ensures that there are no errors so uh, that's really all from my side and i look forward to having uh, some uh, questions from you that's great uh, amit thank you very much you, you can tell from the extent uh, and the variety and wide ranging chat that uh, you've certainly stimulated a lot of discussion and and as i said right at the beginning there's a there's a, a slide deck that has a bunch of stuff in it plenty of content there for us to reflect on and to stimulate conversation um, and i have to say I, <laughs> just to prove the point i've been watching the presentation here on my tablet and my laptop simultaneously in my hotel room in New York and I'm really impressed that it's possible for me to engage in a mobile fashion on my iPad um, with what's going on. Um, thank you everybody for your questions, points and so on. The slide deck uh, will be, I'm not showing off Mr. Rapido, believe me, I'd much rather not have got up at five o'clock this morning <laughs> so that I could meet the time scales for this. Um, I'm very um, Pleased to say that the slide deck, the recording, and the chat will be available uh, later on um, uh, on the website. We had lots of questions in the middle of this about how we're going to do this, and so uh, yes, uh, everything will be available later on. Am I not showing off? Are you sure? Says James, or possibly just a tad? Who knows? Let's talk about some questions. Two acronyms came up early on: Armit, ROI, and BYOD. Of course, this is return on investment and bring your own device. Let's talk about. Uh, return on investment to begin with. Um, it certainly, Amit's seen there's, there's a wide-ranging um, 
set of ways in which mobile can help uh, in the in the workplace. What's the justification? Let's not use the term ROI for the moment, but the business justification arm it that's usually used, or is it not possible to um, say it's usual? Are there any examples of business justifications for the implementation of mobile learning that you've seen? What, what examples are there, Ahmed? Thanks, Don. I think, yes, uh, you know, that's a very important question. Anytime you want to implement something, uh, you know, which is related with training and performance support, uh, you need to justify uh, some sort of ROI. Uh, interesting thing about ROI in any kind of training program is that it's very difficult to prove. And uh, I think folks over here would know that very well. It's very difficult to isolate all the influences yeah. that could have happened. It could be you know, sales target increase or incentives increase or better equipment that has come in, etc. There could be many things that have impacted the performance and not just training. Maybe sometimes you have a good boss, so those people who go to the same training program some of them would be able to implement it better, others may not be able to. So that has actually been one of the, the biggest problem areas for training departments. The thing that I see with mobile learning incidentally is actually that it takes away the bigger loop that you typically find between training and performance. So if you were to go and wear that hat again which says, mobile augmentation, then you're looking at supplementing it. And most often than not, you would be supplementing it with some sort of performance support uh, material. Now, the link between performance support and performance is going to be very direct. Yeah. So yes, again, it would be easier to measure, but it would still not be very easy to measure, but definitely easier, as I said, to measure compared to the training program. There are case studies, uh, you know, I have not included some over here, but that, yes, I can share some of those. Where organizations have reported benefits of what kind of programs they have delivered. And mind you, the benefits over here that we're talking of is actually in increased business parameters directly and not just in the retention or how much a person knows uh, in his head. Rather than okay. the be benefits have really been reported in how much it has impacted the business. I'm just going to cut in there, Armit. I think it's, it's very good points, and you, you obviously know your stuff inside out. I mean, clearly performance is the area in which this gets impact. Coming back to the point of ROI, people might ask or hope to show some statistical relationship between what's happened and the actual performance. As you say, Armit, very difficult to isolate the individual factors. However, coming back to a point that Gary made, Gary said, there's no demand, so it's difficult to get people engaged with them learning. I've seen lots of examples where it's not the people who are in the training department who've done it necessarily, but people out there in the field have put together mobile learning uh, or mobile performance support uh, solutions, which have been tremendously successful um, because they've solved an issue. They haven't tried to put a particular number against it. They've just known that they needed to get more information out to people to help them. Now, Jonathan raises a good point. Sorry, John Carrington says, the problem of measuring value is <clears throat> when it relates to getting information when required, a bit like YouTube. We know it gets used massively, but is it actually any use? I've just, I'm just been doing a conference uh, in New York where people have been talking about a particular mobile learning solution they implemented. They were piloting it, and this, this, I've seen this happen more than once, they were piloting it, and it was so popular that people were coming up to them and saying, no, stop the pilot, just roll the thing out. We want it because, not because we can put a number against the performance improvement, but simply because we know this will solve a problem that we've got. Um, sorry, I've been, I've been talking quite a lot there, and you're not here to listen to me, but listen to Armit. Um, this does come back to this issue of what is learning, what is mobile learning, and how much is, are we talking here about just accessing information? Does it matter? Armit, is there a difference between finding information and using it and learning? And if there is, does mobile lend itself more to one than the other? What do you think? Yeah, let me come back to that uh, in, in a moment. Uh, sure. but just to pick up on the example that you mentioned, Don, it's actually a great example about a 
pilot being done and people coming up and saying, let's just roll it. You know, and there have been other case studies like that where people have started very small. They have, you know, and when, when I was talking about sales teams and technical support teams, that's really been the area where most of the mobile learning solutions have been implemented in, in organizations which have started uh, trying uh, implementing any mobile learning. There have been case studies where they have just implemented it for one department. And everyone else in the organization has really heard from them that it's really helping them. They have been able to do their job better, faster, sometimes with less errors. And that has triggered the adoption of mobile learning in the whole organization. You are very right. If, you know, sometimes measurement would be very difficult, but you don't need it. When your people are saying this is the stuff which helps me get stuff done, your point about error you would simply go and adopt right. it. Yeah. Sorry, go on. All right. So you were talking about uh, uh, information access and whether it is mobile learning or not. Well, whether it's learning or not, and therefore, um, uh, and which mobile is better used for, or, or is there no difference? But please, just l let us have your thoughts on it, Amit. So, I think as adults, we don't really search for any information without purpose. So when you look at the Gottfriedson's moments of learning needs, uh, we were talking about the the, the bunch of three needs, the third, fourth, and fifth, when something goes wrong, when things change, etc. Those are the moments when you are really trying to do something. So most typically when you're searching for information, there is usually an objective behind it, and more often than not in a corporate situation, it would be about doing certain tasks. When you're doing certain tasks, you know, for certain work profiles, a knowledge worker or a concept worker might still be sitting on his desk and having access to the computer. So he could possibly do the same thing on his computer. But for a large sections of, of, of staff in large number of industries, this cannot be done on a computer because you don't have access to a computer. So mobile really fits in very well. And any access to information or search of information is really leading to some sort of performance. So I would say yes. When you are searching for information, you are actually trying to do something. And more often than not, mobile would, have, would be the best option. OK. Um, I think that's really, really well explained. Um, so I'm just making notes to Gertrude. Please contact me. Uh, if DRC is D Democratic Republic of Congo, we can probably help out. So please just, just contact me, and um, I can put you in touch with somebody who, who is doing mobile learning in Africa and could probably help you out. Um, I've been uh, doing this conference uh, over the past couple of days with Charles Jennings, Brandon Hall, and some other people. And we've um, Charles Jennings talks about four areas in which people learn: through experience, through practice, through conversation, and through reflection. And I think every medium we have will help in some form or another with all of those. But some may be better at some than others. And certainly in terms of giving people information when they're involved in practice, probably a mobile device, is, um, is absolutely right. Um, the other thing that I think I'd like to just echo what Armit said at the end of his presentation, Brandon Hall said, look, and his presentation was all about mobile, he said, look, start small, start big, but start. Because the escalator is moving on this, and if you can get onto it, you can start taking advantage of the benefits, start small, but get going. Otherwise, in your case, it was the train. <laughs> the train will come to the station and it will leave. And there is a risk that people will just start doing these things by themselves. And Paul, just to repeat, that was um, experience, practice, conversation, and reflection. Uh, and thank you very much, Alison and Jonathan, also, for all the um, various uh, links have been coming in. Yes, Ed, that's one of my favorite um, quotes from Mark Olert. Um, I just want to come back then, Armit, to this business of BYOD, bring your own device. And I'm sorry, I haven't made a note of who raised it, but so many people raised it. What are the issues around BYOD in terms of getting mobile out to an organization? Any thoughts on that? Is it safe? Is it dangerous? Are there security implications? Will people be unable to handle the data charges? Armit, what do you think? 
Yeah, I think uh, the, the inherent uh, issue with BYOD is really security. You know, uh, and, and there's no doubt that if you have a phone loaded with uh, sensitive information and it gets, it gets lost, uh, that information can be compromised. And it's easier to lose a phone than to lose okay, like a laptop a or a desktop. Temporarily, I'm going to quickly cover the point of BYOD and some of the issues that are raised. Uh, and then I may have to move in to wrap up if he doesn't come back. Bring your own device. Key issue is um, one of the great things about BYOD is you've got already got a distribution network in place and you can get it done. You can get your information out to people quickly without necessarily having to um, go through the IT department or indeed to spend a lot of money on devices. Bad sides, twofold. Firstly, people having to pay data charges on in certain areas and that it's not necessary, but you might have to pay data charges if you've got a particular type of application or if you're using a mobile phone, for example, and you're downloading. If you're using an application on um, a tablet and you're using it on Wi-Fi, of course, you wouldn't have to use um, <laughs> You wouldn't have to use it. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Repito, the D is not drink. It's bring your own device. And uh, the, other bad, the other potential issue with bring your own device, of course, one which is less considered but is a serious issue, is what about security implications. Suppose somebody uh, loses their device and you have no control over it. Suppose um, somebody just leaves the organization and they take a lot of information with them. What control do you have over that? There are ways around that, of course, but it's not necessarily, um, but it's something you need to think about at the beginning because it may be that uh, a particular type of implementation would solve the issue in one way but leave you open in another. Very sadly, it looks as if Armut's connection has just dropped. I'm not quite sure what's happened. It's a sort of rerun of what happened to me uh, five minutes before kickoff when my internet connection dropped. Um, uh, just to give a name check to Dallas Dean here, besides BYOD, it has many interesting implications uh, for global companies. Yeah, Hello. Okay, there's, there's, there's plenty going on here, and this conversation could and should continue. Armut, you're still here. Sorry, Armut, uh, uh, <laughs> would you like to give us your thoughts on BYOD if you're still on the phone? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, I, I really don't know where, where I dropped off, uh, but I could hear everything that you were saying, uh, Don. Uh, so, yes, I mean, what you were saying, I, I agree with that. There is, a host, of course, security issues if you lose uh, your mobile device. And there are high chances of uh, losing a mobile device. There's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, the organizations are implementing some sort of mobile device management uh, tools or mobile application management tools. Uh, if the organizations are supplying devices, they are typically going for uh, a mobile device management tool so that they can control the whole device. If they are letting people bring in their devices, then they typically go for a mobile application management tool so that they can control specific applications. And what this allows them to do is uh, only authorized people can access that content by putting in login passwords or some kind of in. And at the same time, if it is informed that the devices are lost or you know uh, they're not being found, they can have a remote wipe kind of facility. So the data could be wiped out uh, in those applications or in the complete devices, depending on the type of solution you have. But I think more important before you go to that stage is if you're beginning small, typically some of that information is already available in various other formats. And it should not really be a big worry when you are beginning small. It's only it, it's going to come in when you are really rolling it out to the whole of your staff population. Maybe more programs going online, etc. But yeah, there are solutions that are available now. There are solutions. You have to think about it first. And Paul Birchall's raised a very good point about the uh, fact of needing to get local access offline very often to information. Uh, and how that can cause issues if you're not allowed to have local data storage for security reasons. Dallas, of course, wants to know about Tin Cup. Uh, tin Cup, I think, rather than t Tin Camp, perhaps there's a, a typo there. Um, tin Can, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Listen, sorry, Tin Can. <laughs> we'll get there in the end. Thank you, Arvid. Uh, I am, I'm afraid, going to have to wrap up here because the um, uh, we are we are close to the hour. It's uh, coming up to one o'clock in the UK. 
and uh, it's time for us to, to quit. We will always have people who, are, who have to run on to other things. I want to say a big thank you to everybody who's contributed. We had lots of really useful URLs and resources being put in there, plus, of course, as always, great insight uh, and, and thoughts from everybody, different views. Uh, we don't require, this isn't a cult, that people all share the same enthusiasms and ideas. Skepticism and challenging is absolutely part of what we're about. Very useful. Thanks for everybody's thoughts on this. And, of course, thank you to Ahmed for a tremendously well-researched and uh, well-backed-up presentation. And, of course, your next question, everyone's going to be, is it going to be available? And the answer is, of course, yes, it is. Um, the, if you've enjoyed the session, by the way, please let people know about it uh, through Twitter on the, uh, using the hashtag, hash LSG webinar. And if you want to know where this information is available, it is available on the Learning and Skills Group website. That's the URL, www.learningandskillsgroup.org. Dot com, not dot com, dot com. And it's free. We've got four, 5,000, uh, several hundred people on there. Pitch in and join. Now, what about the conference, uh, somebody's asking? Conference details are on the website. And I should say Jack and many others said, look, we should be meeting up and talking. Yes, well, I'm all in favor of meeting up and talking, and that's why we're running a conference uh, in January. Of course, it is a paid-for conference, but there is a free exhibition as well uh, alongside. Let's have a look at, uh, at that. Oh, there it is. Register for the free Learning Technologies Exhibition, and that's the URL. <coughs> oh, and Steve James got his email invite today. Fantastic. Um, and the conference program will be live, I don't know why I say this week. I should say next week. It'll be live next week. Uh, I wrote this slide, so I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, the conference program will be live next week, and the conference will run alongside uh, the exhibition, and, of course, we'll have information. If you want to get together anyway and meet, I would just suggest going to, and you know, you don't have to do it at a conference, we should all be talking to each other anyway. On the Learning and Skills Group, just set up a site and, it's not a sort of site, set up a group of people who want to get together and just invite other people on the group uh, to it and get together for a Twitter meetup or a, a regular unconference where you are. Let's get together, let's talk, and let's keep talking online. Maybe I had a bad day, James? <laughs> You should see my bad days. Uh, what's next? At 2 o'clock, that's in one hour's time, we've got Johanna Sadudi, uh, who <laughs> rolled out uh, social learning and an LMS uh, at L'Oreal, talking about can social learning succeed alongside an LMS? It's a really interesting question. They're usually seen as simply being contra uh, contradictory. Are they? Well, we'll find out from Johanna uh, at 2 o'clock UK time. Uh, in the meantime, once again, my thanks, everyone, for your input. Uh, during this session. Very exciting and to hear everybody's thoughts. And again, Amit Garg, darling in from India, thank you so much for your contribution uh, by putting together a really well-structured, well-researched uh, deck on mobile learning that also had plenty of insight. Amit, thank you so much.